Today I want to spend a bit of time talking about, uh, I guess the word for it would be a paradox. And the word paradox and contradictions come up a great deal, uh, as you can s will tell when we talk about the Islamic Republic. Namely, the question that I would like to explore uh, is the durability of a revolutionary identity in Iran's international relations. And in advance of that, I would like to apologize for periodic cough as I'm <coughs> struggling with uh, residual bronchitis. Uh, more than 30 years since the passing of the founder of the revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, since he came to power, 20 years since he passed, uh, the Islamic Republic in many ways remains, I think it's fair to say, an outlier in international relations. Unlike other non-Western revolutionary states, such as China, uh, Iran has not really made the journey from a revolutionary state to a pragmatic state, from a state that abandoned its revolutionary heritage for sake of more mundane uh, consideration. Uh, the resilience <coughs> of ideology <coughs> as a guide to uh, successive generation of policymakers, Iran is bewildering. After all, you cannot say today that Mao guides China's foreign policy. You cannot really say Ho Chi Minh defines Vietnam's approach to international relations. So why is it that the Islamic Republic continues in some important respects to adhere to the ideological template of its founding uh, revolutionary? even when such policies are detrimental to the national interest of the country, even when such policies are rejected by wide swaths of its population, even when it's rejected by another insignificant portion of the ruling elite. Uh, I think the point that many miss about Iran is that its foreign policy has at times been conducted in a manner designed to sustain its domestic ideological identity sort of China in the 1950s. Uh, at times, leaders may rationally adopt self-defeating foreign policies abroad in order to reinforce a certain ideological identity and character at home. Uh, so therefore, we cannot really understand Iran's international relations by looking at the balance of power in the region, uh, by looking how the region changes, although those are important, but we also have to look at the fact that for a core a member of the Iranian governing elite, the buttressing of Iran's uh, ideological identity has at times required embracing a confrontational foreign policy abroad. So the question is why? Why is it that there's nothing particularly communist about the Chinese Communist Party? Why is it that other revolutionary states have moved uh, in a different direction? <coughs> to be an ex-Marxist is in many ways a sign of intellectual growth and a sign of intellectual maturity. In Iran, Islamic Republic, the founding ideology of the state is a religion. To be sure, a politicized version of the religion, perhaps a distorted version of religion, but religion nevertheless. So you can become an ex-Marxist, but to become an ex-member of the Iran's revolutionary elite is in many ways apostasy. So one is intellectual growth, the other is uh, apostasy. How easy is it to become an ex-GI? In one case, it's renouncing a political faith. In another case, it's renouncing a much more uh, primordial identity. So how did this happen? How did Iran come to embed ideology in its character to the extent that it has defied the normative patterns that we understand? Uh, you have to go back to the founder of the revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, who was probably one of the most successful revolutionaries of 20th century. Lenin, Mao, and others had a vision, but that vision has largely eclipsed. 30 years after he came to power, he has embedded his vision in the political system. He has molded a certain institutional arrangements. He has devised a certain cadre that insists on prolonging his revolutionary ideological uh, ideas. Uh, <coughs> Ayatollah Khomeini had a vision, and the vision was that international system is essentially an illegitimate one. The concept of nation state, a redundant one. And Iran would be a vanguard state that will lead the Middle East to the path of redemption and indeed resurrection. 
Uh, I mean, to be sure, no country can live on ideology alone. Iran had to exist in the environment, had to operate its economy, had to fight its wars. That required, at times, unsavory compacts with various adversaries. Pragmatism does get injected in body politics, but it has to coexist with a certain revolutionary vision. Uh, from the very beginning, Khomeini's internationalist, vi internationalist vision required a foil, someone who he kind of defines the Islamic Republic against, and that foil was the West. To be sure, uh, a caricatured version of the West, and particularly the United States, but nevertheless. The rejection of the West came at two levels. On the one hand, it's a sort of a Berkeley 1968, so a north-south divide. The West is rejected uh, because it's a source of material exploitation of the developing communities, developing nations. So the West is rapacious, plundering, capitalist, exploitive country, as I said, sort of Berkeley 68. Uh, on the one hand, the West is rejected in Huntingtonian terms. Khomeini was nothing if not a Huntingtonian, that civilizations are clashing and the Islamist forces have to maintain their own identity in light of this onslaught. So he had a certain vision of the West. Uh, in one case, it was a source of cultural pollution. In the other case, it was a source of capitalist exploitation. And these two visions that really don't come together very well uh, seem to have come together in a rather seamless way. Uh, three episodes from the 1980s can underscore how foreign policy was used uh, to buttress that revolutionary transformation at home. The first is the hostage crisis. Uh, it is often forgotten that in 1979, when the Islamic Revolution first succeeded, the first government that took power was actually a fairly moderate government, a provisional government. It didn't want to be part of the East-West conflict, the Cold War conflict, but it didn't want to sever relationship with the United States. It wanted to <coughs> maintain fairly decent relationship with the United States, at least a diplomatic and commercial relationship. It wasn't going to be part of the Western Bloc, as it was called at that time, but it wasn't going to necessarily sever those relationships either. For the revolutionaries that had come to power, the task at hand was to undermine the government of the provisional government. They had to write a constitution that essentially created certain institutional arrangements that made the Islamic Republic the state that it is, and they also wanted to refashion Iran's foreign policy with at least anti-Americanism as a, one of its central pillars. So on November <coughs> 4, 1979, a group of Iranian students, as you know, hold the American embassy, breach the American embassy, hold 66 Americans hostage for 444 days. There's been a lot of discussions about this. Some suggest that Khomeini didn't know about it and then exploited the takeover of the embassy some of the recent evidence suggests that he actually did know about it, but the Islamic Republic that is quite adept at trying to whitewash his history has suggested that he did not, but he seemed to have. Uh, however, the hostage crisis came. It was, you know, gift from heaven because essentially Khomeini used that episode to galvanize the population behind the notion that the revolution was endangered by the United States and its domestic accomplices and therefore it has to essentially stand up for the defense of the revolution. The demise of the provisional government was all but certain, and a new constitution was devised along the lines envisioned by Khomeini. On December, I think it was 2nd, 1979, Iran would have a new constitution that created a series of institutions, Supreme Leader's Office, the Guardian Council, and so forth, that were exempt from electoral scrutiny, that had a mass significant degree of power, that constitutional provision that was essentially put forth as a referendum, a frenzied population that was seeking to defend the revolution voted that in, and you began to see certain institutional arrangements were created at that time, codified in the constitution, remain intact today, where non-elected branches of government have all the power that they need to control the population uh, and its electoral mandates that would change over time. The regime's propaganda machine at that time insisted that secular intellectuals, the westernized elite, sort of accomplices of U.S. imperialism, wanted the plot to undermine the revolution. It worked. Two other factors have to explain the hostage crisis of 1979. One was payback, the idea of humiliation of the United States that in the vision of Iran's new rulers had done much to subjugate Iran. 
And the second was to refashion a new foreign policy, a foreign policy whose foundation would be much more radical, much more militant, a foreign policy that was no longer about neutralism and exemption from Cold War conflicts, but assertion of radical Islamism as a foundation of Iran's approach to the region. Though symbolic act, therefore, achieved many things. Uh, whether there was a plot against Iran's revolution emanating from American embassy is doubtful. Well, it's not doubtful, it's just not, not true. Uh, but still, you began to see the exploitation of the hostage crisis to create a certain kind of republic, to purge that republic of more moderate elements, and also usher in a new foreign policy that was one of confrontation and radicalism. The second episode of the 1980s was, of course, the Iran-Iraq war that also helped mold the ideological transformation of Iran. Uh, all revolutionary states, well, most revolutionary states eventually come to conflict abroad. Iran was no different. Iranian revolutionaries were no different than French revolutionaries. They thought that their message had resonance beyond their border. I mean, if you discovered God's mandate, why would you want to keep it in your country? Other people should share in that. So Iranian governments soon began to challenge the legitimacy of the Gulf monarchies. To be sure, the Gulf monarchies had a lot of deficiencies challenge the sovereignty of Bahrain, you know, plot the assassination of the Kuwaiti <coughs> emirs, uh, a particular conflict with Saudi Arabia, and you kind of see why. These are two countries that tend to predicate their legitimacy on a transnational mission, one based upon religion. Uh, Ayatollah Khomeini died <coughs> in 1988. His last will and testament had pages and pages of condemnation of Saudi Arabia. You figure in your last will and testament, you will leave a kind of a more memorable, kind of a more progressive legacy. But as I suppose to spend pages condemning the Saudis for practicing what he called American Islam. So that animosity runs deep. It is often suggested that the greatest animosity is between US and Iran. It's the most entrenched animosity between the two has been between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And you can sort of understand why, as I mentioned, these are two states that feel they should have a larger mission in the Middle East and the basis of that mission is religious assertion. Uh, the state that became most affected <coughs> by Iranian propaganda and mischief was, of course, Iraq, with its large Shi'i population. That proved to some extent receptive to Iranian message, particularly the Iraqi Shi'i community. Uh, some of the more esteemed clerics in Iraq began to essentially mimic the lines coming from Tehran until they were rather executed in an unceremonious way by Saddam. That sort of ended religious dissent. Uh, despite Iranian provocation, it is important to say in September 1980, it was Iraq that invaded Iran. Uh, the Iran-Iraq war is actually one of the most peculiar conflicts in the Middle East, not because it took, it was so, such a prolonged conflict, eight years, it really still remains the longest conflict in interstate history of the Middle East. But if you look at the Iranian perspective <laughs> and the propaganda and so on, they never define the conflict the way states ordinarily define war objectives, territory gain and loss, boundaries, reparations. It was none of that. The war was about redemption, religious honor. Iran was a pristine religious state embodying the prophet's message, and that's why it was invaded by forces of disbelief and inauthenticity, Iraq. So it's hard to compromise when that's your vision. <laughs> uh, so the, the war was a crusade, it wasn't a conflict. And the Iraqi regime represented the forces of iniquity and impiety, and therefore through collective sacrifice, and spiritual attainment, uh, somehow the Iranian state would fend off the invaders. Uh, the other aspect of the war was that it was actually celebrated by Khomeini. He called the war the third revolution. The first revolution was the actual revolution, the second revolution was takeover of the embassy, and the third revolution was war. Because he saw war as a means of once more cleansing and purging the Iranian society of all elements of opposition to his state suddenly the entire nation state was mobilized behind defending the country. And the themes of nationalism and religious orthodoxy merged rather seamlessly. That's always the case. I mean, the sociologists will tell you that. <coughs> so in 
So the war was celebrated. By June of 1982, Iran had evicted Iraq from its territory. <coughs> if they wanted to end the war, they could have. They were offered generous reparations, but it was the, probably the most important decision that the Islamic Republic made was in 1982, namely the decision to prolong the war. And the decision to prolong the war was made in order to once again refashion and entrench the ideology of the state at home, uh, to mold a new elite, the new man as it was called, not that similar to some of the Marxist lexicon. Uh, the war lasted for another six years with devastating costs for the Iranian society uh, and eventually the employment of vast quantities of chemical weapons uh, by the Iraqi forces. It is at times suggested that chemical weapons are not particularly useful in military conflicts. They sure were useful in this case. They really had a decisive military role uh, because the way Iranians would fight the war was the notion that they would overcome technological superiority of Iraq by human wave assaults, by numbers. And so the chemical weapons really had an effect in blunting various Iranian offensives. Um, so the notion that chemical weapons are not decisive weapons of war is to some extent belied by the experience in Iran. They, they may not be suitable for the kind of conflict that is taking place in Syria, but they sure were of use. And one of the reasons why the war ended, the war ended for the same reason that the war began. The war ended because it suddenly threatened the viability of the state. Suddenly, if you look at one of the amazing things about the Iran-Iraq war, really a, poor, a poorly studied phenomenon, a historical subject, is that in the first <coughs> six years or so, from the Iranian perspective, the war was fought by volunteers. There was very little conscription. There was very little draft. The same people would volunteer over and over again. There was a segment of Iranian society that was not affected by the war. That by the last two, three years, that, that was gone. The country was exhausted. It was economically bankrupt. Uh, the, they had to do conscription. They had to get a lot of people simply because they needed numbers, given the technological inferiority. Iraq had access to weapons from, so, but from both uh, Cold War blocs, Soviet Union and the Western Europeans. So, The Iranians had access to some military supplies abroad. They would get them from North Korea, which means Chinese weapons from North Korea. Uh, of all the countries that dealt with Iranians in the 1980s, and the Iranians had alienated everybody, uh, and they had animosity toward everybody, the Soviet Union, the United States, the Western Europe, the Gulf States, Israel, Europeans, and you know. The one country that always had a very good public diplomacy toward Iran then and now was China. Because the Chinese representatives would go to the Iranians and say, uh, you, were, you were a great civilization, right? Yeah, yeah. So were we. <laughs> Infringed and molested and abused by the Westerners, right? Yeah, yeah. We can, huh? <laughs> we can hum a few bars of that tune. Yeah, I know. I know. And you you became independent and emancipated through a revolution. Hey, yeah, 1949, yeah, we, us too. Uh, the fact over that the Chinese sold a lot of weapons to the Iraqis, <laughs> but Iran has never held it against them because they had such an effective public diplomacy, even today. The, the, this the only country that has figured out how to talk to Iranian Islamists. We're sort of appealing to the same common civilizational greatness abused and molested by the West. Obviously a public diplomacy campaign not available to the West. Uh, <laughs> but still. Uh, <coughs> the war left an imprint on Iranian international orientation. Two themes come into Iranian cosmology at this point, I guess. Self-sufficiency and self-reliance. What happens to you is what you do. Uh, you can't rely on anybody else. Iran fought the war without <coughs> any measurable allies. <coughs> and the other aspect of, of, of the war was a sort of disrespect, maybe that's too strong, disregard for international organizations and international opinion. 
international organization, the United Nations and others, did not do much uh, with rather indiscriminate use of chemical weapons by Iraq. Uh, the Iranian narrative is not entirely true. The UN does investigate it. The UN does condemn it. The United States does condemn it. Uh, so the Iranian narrative that everybody ignored it was wrong. But, you know, it, censure did not necessarily mean uh, other viable measures. Uh, so in language of today, Iraqis violated the international norms uh, rather persistently and systematically. With censure, but no impunity. But with censure and impunity, I should say. So, you know, UN rebukes you, hey, you know, where was UN in 1982? And lack of respect for Western sensibilities. Oh, suddenly you're against weapons of mass destruction? Uh, so that becomes part of the Iranian narrative about contradictions and, and, and shortcomings of the Western approach, the or hypocrisy argument. You know, uh, the Western countries are averse to weapons of des mass destruction if, if they are not being used on behalf of their interests. That kind of, and the argument does have some resonance, does have some truth to it. Uh, as I said, the Iranian argument is overstated and exaggerated, but not entirely without, without cause. And the war ended, as I mentioned, because of the fear that Iranians had that Saddam would now be targeting Iranian population centers with chemical weapons. By 1988, uh, the Iraqis had obtained long-range missiles which made, from the French, uh, which made all the Iranian cities now within the purview of the Iraqi military capability, the projectiles. And the fear that chemical weapons would be launched against Iranian urban centers, not just battlefront, was actually a decisive issue in Iranians suing for peace and ending the war. Uh, uh, you can see it from sort of a memoir literature and others. Uh, as Rafsanjani said, after Halabja, they feared that Iranian population would, what he said, fall like leaves in the fall. So just, they, they feared that Saddam would use chemical weapons against Iranian civilians in cities, and they were right, he probably would have. Uh, so the war comes to an end. But the war consolidates the revolution at home. It introduces a new international orientation with self-sufficiency at its core. But toward the end of his life, Ayatollah Khomeini is worried as he approaches the end of his life. He grows apprehensive about the vitality of the revolution after his passing. He has held the country together. He has sort of infused the social fabric of Iran with revolutionary spirit. Well, what happens after he dies? And by 1988, he's, you know, he's not in good shape. Dies in 89. He does two things toward the end of his life to ensure the survival of the revolution after his passing. Uh, the first one was to order uh, mass execution of prisoners, <coughs> Iranian prisoners, political dissidents. Who knows, between 3,000 to 8,000 people are said to have been summarily executed. Why did he do it? He wanted to see, we can only speculate, the most plausible explanation that I have seen is he wanted to see if his lieutenants would carry it out. If they had the will and the power to shed blood on behalf of the revolution. And they all did, except one, who proved too humane, Ayatollah Montessori. That's when he was purged. He wanted to see if they were willing to commit indiscriminate, unwarranted violence on behalf of the revolution. And the one who didn't would be purged. They all did, <laughs> except, as I said, one. Uh, one of the judges, that, well, the way they would do it in the prison, they would have a committee of three judges. And they would bring the prisoner in, who was a political dissident. Some of them had already pretty much served their sentence. And they would say, um, you know, uh, are you reformed, repentant? I said, yeah, yeah. They said, uh, you willing to do anything for Islam? Sure, absolutely. You willing to go to front and if he take you to the front, would you dive on an Iraqi 
mine. So, well, wait a minute here. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about this. <laughs> okay, you're, you, you're insufficiently redeemed. That's it. One of the people who was one of the committee of judges was a man named Mustafa Pur Muhammadi, who's now Minister of Justice, incongruously enough. But maybe there's a sort of macabre logic to it. The second thing, which is perhaps best known, is the, <coughs> in February 1989, is the publication of a book by Salman Rushdie, Satanic, satanic phrase, uh, Verses, uh, which depicted the prophet in an unflattering light, a work of fiction. Uh, the fatwa calling for execution of that author for publication of that book, which was really designed to estrange Iran from the West. And it worked. Um, nobody talked about Salman Rushdie had previously received literary prizes from Islamic Republic. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> Uh, so it was a convenient uh, act of blasphemy, the most famous fatwa out there, issued in February 1989. These two acts were designed to test the loyalty and the resilience of his followers, lieutenants, who would take over from him because he was going to die, and also to establish a controversy that would further estrange Iran <coughs> from the West, and it did, actually, quite, quite profoundly. Ayatollah uh, so Khomeini dies in June of 1989, probably will go down as the most successful revolutionary of his time. His revolutionary vision continues to exist. His legacy is indisputed, honored. You know, there's no, uh, what was it, 20th Party Congress speech where Khrushchev renounces Stalin. It doesn't happen. They don't even have the Chinese formula that Mao was 70% uh, what is it, 70% bad and 30% good, but the good was really good. <laughs> you know, so the, they don't even have that. They have a fairly unadulterated and pristine view uh, presentation of Ayatollah Khomeini. His legacy, as I said, is celebrated, and his revolutionary vision in many ways intact. The 1990s <coughs> would stand probably as the most important decade in the history of Islamic Republic. There's only been three. Uh, because now you introduce something else in the body politic of the Islamic Republic, factionalism. Before that, there was one guy. And if you had disputes and you had disagreements, there was a port of last call. Now there isn't. The state factionalizes. Uh, the new president of Iran in 1989, Ayatollah Rafsanjani, and his followers, which would become known in the context of Iranian politics of pragmatists, of which the current president derives that from, uh, they said, listen, I mean, we've got to have to have a new national compact other than martyrdom and death. Uh, we've got to just, we've we got to have something else to sell here. Uh, you know, I mean, just telling these people to be martyrs is, is wearing a little thin. Uh, we have to economically reconstruct the country, which is devastated. We require financial credits, technology, investments. We just have to move to renegotiating the national compact. Uh, the basis of Islamic Republic's legitimacy cannot just be external conflict and external enemies. The population is young, the country's needs are significant, and we just kind of have to renegotiate how we deal with our constituents. Uh, a more hardline devotees of Khomeini <laughs> don't really dispute that. They understand that there's, there's a requirement for economic revitalization and economic rehabilitation. You, I mean, you just have to see that. They understand that that requires not a better, but certainly a different relationship with some Western countries. But they have their concerns. Uh, how to maintain the revolution where everybody's tired of it? How do you maintain Islamic revolutionary identity when the population doesn't want to want to move on. Even the portion of the ruling elite wants to sort of move on. So in some ways, they become more entrenched in the themes of resisting cultural subversion. The most representative of this particular faction, this hard life faction, I'm sort of simplifying it, was the current Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei. He becomes the head of the group of people who believe in politics of resistance. Uh, 
And it, it, an entire literature develops around that. The legitimacy, legitimacy of the Islamic Republic is not predicated on popular approbation. If the population doesn't like it, so what? We answer to God. And we kind of decided he likes it. Uh, you know, these are men who claim to know the mind of God. No offense <laughs> to the assembled clarity. <laughs> Uh, and so the, the concept of democratic collective will and popular approbation, uh, you know, yeah, sure, but, you know, the purpose of the Islamic Republic is to maintain a certain divine ordinance. It is a recipient of a divine mandate. And the purpose of the state is to cherish that, cultivate that, preserve it, even if they don't want it. Uh, they could never figure out why the young Iranians don't want to spend their time reading ponderous religious text. Uh, well, you know. uh, so there's a determination to maintain that revolutionary identity using institutions of the state. Uh, <coughs> this factionalism causes a certain degree of contradiction in Iranian politics, certain degree of unpredictability uh, in terms of Iran's foreign relations. Iran behaves moderately and judiciously with the first Gulf War. It understands the collapse of the Soviet Union has changed the international system and they have to behave somewhat differently. Uh, it tries to come to terms with the Persian Gulf countries, at least recognizing the legitimacy of the governing order as opposed to trying to undermine it and call for instigating Shi uprisings and exhorting the masses to embrace Iran's revolutionary model. It called for greater security ec economic cooperation at the same time, Iran was still practicing what we would call terrorism, most notably the 1996 Kobar Tower bombing uh, in Saudi Arabia that claimed the lives of a number of uh, American servicemen. Uh, it still assisted forces of resistance, Hezbollah, Hamas. Uh, it still practiced terrorism. Even in the European, even when there was a recognition that they needed European trade, uh, the Europeans were quite eager and anxious to embrace Iranian pragmatism and the Europeans in the 1990s launched a policy that they call critical dialogue, which in essence meant they would have a dialogue with Iran while being critical of the United States. Uh, the, the, but under the auspices of critical dialogue, what they tried to do was essentially have an economic relationship with Iran and a political and diplomatic relationship because the idea was that that would create a reinforcing set of networks and therefore would husband Iranian pragmatism. Well, one of the practices of the Islamic Republic, of course, was to assassinate Iranian dissidents in Europe. And that became in particularly the case with Mykonos. Mykonos is a restaurant in Berlin where a number of Kurdish dissidents were, three were killed by Iranian agents as determined by a German court. Terrorism and the Rushdie affair Iranians can never resolve it. Raf Sanjani will say, ah, you know, uh, we cannot reverse the fatwa. Imam Khomeini's fatwa is there. He's an esteemed religious figure. He said Rushdie is going to have to be killed for his act of blasphemy. We can't reverse that. But we don't have to enforce it. Uh, as soon as he said that, somebody else will say, yes, we do. <laughs> and you began to see they could never get the relationship with Europe straight. The relationship with the United States were never straightened out at this point. There were, there were some attempts, some gestures, but nothing. Terrorism became a basis of Iranian estrangement from the international community. The one place where Iranian pragmatism is almost complete and, 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 and without reservation is in terms of relationship with the Russian Federation. Iran has much better relationship with the Russian Federation than it does with the Soviet Union. Uh, maybe because it's no longer dealing with Marxism as some sort of another universalist ideology. Uh, and also maybe because it's so isolated from the West that it requires the Russian Federation as a source of diplomatic protection, as a source of weapon sales. And of course, Russia at this point has much surplus military supplies and Iran is nothing but an eager 
uh, an eager uh, purchaser. That requires some compromises. There's a problem. <laughs> the Russians are slaughtering Chechnyans, who just happen to be Muslim. <laughs> Iranians largely look the other way. As when Chinese do the same thing to their Muslim population. I mean, occasionally they complain, you know, but the Russian assault on a largely Muslim population does not seem to disturb a state that, as a founding mission, claims the welfare of every Muslim counts. Well, uh, I guess not the Chechnya. Uh, Iran's international orientation <coughs> in the 1990s does go through a change. It is no longer an orthodox revolutionary state. It is a state that tries to accommodate national interest calculations with revolutionary values. It is an uneasy accommodation, a contradictory accommodation, a self-defeating one. It just cannot make the transition to a, what you, we would call a normal state. It doesn't go to the trajectory of China. It's halting. Two steps this way, two steps that way, two steps this way, two steps that way. It is baffling. They speak with multiple voices. They're contradictory. They profess pragmatism. They engage in terrorism. They're moderate. They're injudicious. They're petulant. They're tempered. All in one. The most momentous change in Iran's foreign policy comes in a brief reformist interlude from 1997 to 2005, with the rise of the real reform movement, uh, with the rise of Mohammad Khatami. The reform movement had at its thesis that you cannot liberalize Iran's domestic politics while being at odds with the international community. You cannot have a siege mentality abroad and engage in domestic liberalization. If you're going to engage in domestic liberalization, the necessary coda to that is a more moderate foreign policy. Uh, and it, there is a move toward a real moderation. You begin to see a lot in the literature about the end of revolution. Uh, there's a good neighbor policy where Iran, for a period of time, reconciles with the Saudi Arabia. The, policy, the basis of that reconciliation is the Iranian pledge no longer to instigate uh, uprisings against the Saudis, mobilizing the Shi community against the Saudis, and so on. There is reconciliation with Europe, where the Rushdie affair is finally put behind them. It took another eight years, 1997-98, when Iran categorically repudiates the assassination decree. And Salman Rushdie begins to make his way around and becomes a more visible presence in the literary community. Uh, Iran ends the practice of killing Iranian dissidents in Europe, maybe partly because there were no much, that many Iranian dissidents left in Europe. Uh, but still, the practice formally comes to an end. There is an attempt to deal with Israel. First time. Mohammed Khatami says, look, uh, who speaks on behalf of Israelis? Who speaks on behalf of Palestinians? Is it Hamas? Or is it Palestinian Authority? We think it's the Palestinian Authority. So if the Palestinian Authority wants to accept peace with Israel, you know, we're not going to be more Catholic than the Pope. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <why is, laughs> uh, so there is a sort of a movement away. And Iran actually acknowledges the Arab peace offer of 2000, namely that if Israel moves to pre-1967 borders, and the Palestinians accept that, that'll be fine. Now, you can be cynical about this, saying Iran says we will accept a peace that Palestinians accept, knowing full well Palestinians and Israelis will never come to peace. So it's a, you know, so in some ways. But there was a real movement <coughs> on that front. And I think there's a recognition that so long as Iran remains antagonistic to Israel, it's very difficult for it to become a normal state. That's just the way of life. It's just the way it is. Um, it's going to have a lot of problems in the United States. It's going to have a lot of problems everywhere. You can complain about that, but that's just the way the world works. Uh, you can't have enrichment and a relationship with Hezbollah. It's unfair. So what? It's just the way it is. Is everything your life fair? Uh, there's an approach toward America. In recognizing the deep wall of mistrust between the two states, there's a discussion that, you know, there has to be 
cultural exchanges, intellectual exchanges, sport exchanges, and did, as I said, maybe I didn't say it, I said at some point today, U.S.-Iranian relations tend to oscillate between hysteria of war and euphoria of rapprochement. So this is the euphoria of rapprochement. Uh, two things undermine the Khatami presidency's international orientation. Number one, of course, the domestic forces of reaction. You know, the, the usual hardline groups, they come in and there's a real assault on the reformist group through assassinations, terrorism, uh, arbitrary arrests, jail, closure of newspapers. So there's an assault on the physical aspect of the reform movement. And the politics of 9-11. When 9-11 takes place, Iranian reformists think this could be good for them as sort of more enlightened Islamists, they are as offended <coughs> of Taliban as anybody else. They abhor Al-Qaeda. They could potentially cooperate with the United States in rehabilitation and reconstitution of Afghanistan. So this is all good news. Uh, yet the politics of 9-11 worked differently in the United States. And you began to see Iran being viewed not so much as a country that can assist in the war on terror, but as a country within the target of the war on terror. Uh, when President Bush talked about the nexus of weapons of mass destruction and terrorism, that's Iran a lot more than Saddam's Iraq. So the politics of 9-11 work differently for the Iranian regime at home. So at home and abroad, it becomes subject to much censure, criticism, and eventually it runs out of steam. 1997, 2005, I think is an important period. Mohammad Khatami's presidency is viewed as a failure. I think that's wrong, if certainly overstated. Uh, he is the president that did most to pull Iran away from the revolutionary legacy of Ayatollah Khomeini. Try to refashion the state at home, try to create something called an Islamic democracy. Maybe that just can't be done try to harmonize Republican principles with religious values, maybe that can't be done. Uh, try to introduce moderation into Iranian foreign policy, even dealing with issue of Israel a bit differently. Fail to adjust that in a permanent basis, but he was the president that did the most uh, in that respect. And historical record should acknowledge that. Uh, here's where Iran differs from everybody else. In 2005, the revolution is going a certain way, then it goes the other way. The rise of a new right. Instead of revolution just fading from the scene, it's resurrected by the rise of a new generation of conservatives, uh, pious young men, sometimes called the war generation, uh, from which Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is a representative of. He's a representative of a social class. Uh, <coughs> a, combustible, a combustible mixture of Islamism, nationalism, and xenophobia become the basis of Iran's foreign policy and its domestic identity, suspicious of the West, distrustful of their neighbors, and see the Middle East as a place where there's a battle of secularism and Islamic authenticity. Uh, the rise of the new right in Iran in 2005, <coughs> excuse me, coincides with some important changes in the Middle East, uh, namely the sort of a decline of the American influence with the prolongation and exhaustion of the Iraq war, inability to deal with Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan issue, uh, the rise of Islamist movement, Hezbollah, Hamas, in due course the Arab awakening which weren't necessarily to the advantage of Iran, but certainly removed some important pillars of Western presence, Mubarak and so on. Uh, and if you listen to the people of President Ahmadinejad's generation, uh, who were probably in their 20s in the 1980s, they tend to have this mythical veneration of the 1980s. Let's look at the 1980s. Uh, Iran was at war with Iraq, its population was exhausted, there was ethnic separatism with the Kurds, it was isolated, beleaguered, impoverished. It is kind of hard to look at that and say, wow, that was good times. <laughs> but they do. 
<laughs> Yet they do. So, uh, why was it a good times? Uh, the nation was united around the revolution. Uh, the state wasn't that corrupt. Corruption really comes into Iranian body politics in the aftermath of the war. That's because then there's money, right, to spend the contracts, the rehabilitation, reconstruction. Before that, every cent would go to the war effort. Corruption is corrosive. Corruption is corrosive in China. Corruption is particularly corrosive in the theocracy. That talks about, you know, God, morality, and ethics. You know, this is half of them are on the take. Uh, so, you know, 1980s, there was no corruption. People actually believed in the revolution. So you can see why they have a sort of a nostalgic, a historical view of it, but I guess most nostalgia tend to be ahistorical. Uh, in some ways, all of Iran's international relations are being distorted by the nuclear issue. Uh, relationship with the European is distorted by that. There's no really European trade anymore. Relations with China and Russia are adjusted by that, affected by that, because the Chinese and the Russians from the very beginning told the Iranians, hey, you know, we're not going to bail you out at the UN. We're going to help you out a little bit, but not much. The relationship with the United States is certainly strange because of that, more so <laughs> than it was in the past. And the relationship with Israel, which is probably the most peculiar international relations that Iran has had. Iran and Israel have been at odds with one another. They have denied each other's existence. They have denigrated each other's history. But after 30 years of that, there has never been a direct military confrontation between the two. They both relied on proxy wars. Iranians helped Hezbollah and others, and Israelis tried to mobilize the international community behind a policy of economic pressure against Iran. Now there is a possibility of conflict. Uh, so the nuclear issue has had a devastating effect. For a long time uh, on the nuclear issue, briefly, what the Iranian government tried to do is maintain a degree of economic empowerment and a degree of nuclear ascendance. Uh, you can't really do that. It's just, it's just gonna have to be one or the other. In 2012, Iran has another election, uh, which actually is the least interesting of all the elections that they have had. The 1997 election was about political liberalization. The 2005 election of President Ahmadinejad was about economic justice. The 2012 election is about, let's lift sanctions. <laughs> let's do something abroad. Let's relieve some press, some pressure. Uh, it, it is the least interesting election in that respect. Uh, but it's an election that takes place in a very specific context where economic s situation in Iran is deteriorating. Uh, statistics are hard to come by. Uh, and will remain to be seen how this issue is resolved. <coughs> the resolution of this issue could in some ways determine the stability and future of the Middle East. If it's resolved peacefully, then you begin to see a great, some degree of stability. If it's resolved violently, you may see some degree of considerable instability. If the stalemate continues, which is hard to see how it can continue, uh, you may see continued level of low intensity conflict between Iran and its neighbors. In the end, I want to come back to a theme I started with, namely that Iran is not a typical revolutionary state. That was the theme, if you missed it. Uh, uh, Khomeini was too much of an innovator. Uh, the institutions he created, the elite he molded, uh, mean his vision is not a passing one. It, it, it is part and parcel of the Islamic Republic. On a range of issues from its antagonism to the United States, antagonism to Israel, denial of Holocaust, which they all do, Iran has sustained in as animosities uh, long after such hostilities uh, proved self-defeating. Uh, the theoretic, theocratic state today is what it's always been, a state divided against itself. Uh, struggling to define a coherent identity, coherent objectives. Still, 
30 years later, revolutionary pretensions still battle with national interest calculations. Uh, Islamic Republic alters its course, sometimes move a little this way, sometimes that way, but it simply cannot escape uh, the totality of its founder's vision. It just keeps pulling it back. There's an anchor that keeps pulling it down. I, for the West, I think in many ways China has defined our experience of what a revolutionary state looks like. They start out with a great degree of revolutionary fervor, then they sort of give that up, uh, and they become sort of a sort of unsavory businessman. Uh, foreign policy decision making are free of ideological considerations. Next generation of leaders come. The, the trajectory and direction toward pragmatism continues. That's how we think of revolutionary states. We don't think of revolutionary states that are continue to be mired in their own revolution, except if we look at ourselves. <laughs> we haven't given up our revolutionary identity either. Uh, but Iran continues to puzzle. We keep asking why has Iran yet to become a post-revolutionary country? What makes this more different than China or Vietnam? Um, how could a country like Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in 2005 when the natural tendency and the compulsions of history should move it in one direction? How can that be? Uh, again, it's difficult to reclaim a legacy. It's difficult to move away from its ideological vision. In the end, Islamic Republic, I think, has maintained its revolutionary identity in face of many countervailing pressures and stresses. Mass defection, elite fragmentation, economic dislocation. You can explain that by saying the institutional juggernauts that the Constitution has created. You can explain that by the elite that has been molded in Khomeini's image. But well, one way of explaining how the revolution has succeeded in sustaining itself is foreign policy. The foreign policy of the country in some ways is designed not just to advance its interests abroad, but to maintain its revolution at home. Uh, as such, <coughs> sort of thinking about Iranian foreign policy by just focusing on external determinations, changing balance of power in the region, the rise and fall of superpowers, the ebbing and flowing of the American influence, I think it misses a key ingredient of how Islamic Republic think of itself and thinks of its role in the Middle East.